Hi, this is Christian Takushi, macroeconomist in Switzerland, coming to you with the latest geopolitical update. Um, there is so much to be said at the end of 2022. Uh, I would just like to focus uh, this time on five very important issues of strategic relevance that I believe are important to be shared because um, consensus is underestimating their importance or not even reporting about them. Um, the first one is uh, focus and keeping an eye on the big picture. I think um, like seldom before, it's been very difficult, very difficult for, for, for people, uh, be it decision makers, politicians, business owners, even investors, to really have an eye, a clear view of the big picture. Um, understandably, because media and the news have been completely focused on COVID for two years and now on the war in Ukraine in 2022. And, and so many people uh, have been absorbed by these um, two events in these last uh, three years that has actually probably distorted uh, a clear view for the big picture. and. Um, my contributions here, or what I'm trying to do here, is to is to help people keep um, keep a clear view of what the big picture is out there, what the landscape is, especially bringing to you issues that um, I think consensus is uh, completely overlooking, and our media not reporting about things that consensus is overlooking or underestimated or underestimating because it's focused on, on, you know, on the big headline news. Um, the first one, you know, this is the first uh, uh, topic, I think, focus. I think too many people have lost focus of the big picture. So keep an eye on the big picture in 2023 and try to avoid getting absorbed with what the media is pushing or drumming up, okay? Uh, the second issue I believe is uh, incredibly important is energy. Pay attention to what is happening in the energy market and do try to do your own analysis and homework. Um, what is happening in the energy market will, will have imp an impact and consequences on, 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 on the lives of many people in Europe in years to come. Europe is becoming simply uncompetitive with its energy costs. The energy costs in Europe are becoming very uncompetitive and this will have not just a impact on inflation in Europe, but the way of life in Europe, the quality of life, but more importantly, also on production. Uh, on this path, there will be quite a lot of production shifting away from Europe to other parts of the world. Guess where the United States is probably gonna be one of the main beneficiaries of this. And um, we have already a major problem in the energy sector because for 13 years, uh, companies in the oil and gas sector have not been able to invest, to modernize uh, or to do repairs or do proper maintenance. And the reason was our green, our green actually um, tra transition um, that our governments and our media and NGOs so much wanted. All of these well-meaning uh, intentions or well-meaning goals, but unfortunately, uh, we in the financial industry uh, put a lot of shame on investors who wanted to give money and loans and credit to these companies. So uh, the governments, the financial industry, uh, they actually didn't provide enough capital or incentives for companies in this area to reinvest, to protect the facilities, to do proper maintenance of the facilities, to do proper re repairs. The whole energy um, or not, 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 let's say not to say the whole because some some countries stand out a little bit, but most of the global energy sector, especially gas and oil, has been going through a kind of famine, uh, hunger. They have not been receiving enough capital and enough attention. The the gas and energy facilities around the world are not in a good shape. They are in a bad shape. And most of us, one way or the other, are co-responsible for that, uh, especially Western governments and the Western financial industry are the two main culprits 
for that. Uh, and if we have to add a third one is our central banks, Western central banks. They also, uh, with the zero interest rate policies, they made it very uninteresting for companies to invest in, in you know, in facilities. They just, uh, people, companies were just buying, uh, taking loans to buy back their shares and make money that way. Other companies were just, instead of investing, were buying competitors with loan money. So uh, this combination of our, I would say, naive government policies with the Me Too, ESG, um, uh, I would say, uh, also thinking in the banking industry, financial industry, and our monetary policy of Western central banks have kind of decimated the the gas and oil facilities around the world they are not in a good shape so we are in and on top of that we have now geopolitical problems and a war and a year where there is not enough wind and so that which we invested in um, let's just talk about wind energy has not produced and delivered the way we wanted so um, we we didn't take care of our gas and oil facilities and and some of the new facilities, the renewable energy we, we invested all our money and effort in has not delivered or is not there yet. And on top of that, we probably switched off some nuclear power plants uh, too early, you know, and we didn't pay attention to these uh, geopolitical risks that we were going into. So the whole energy transition um, of the West, especially Europe, has been a total mess, really, has been a total mess. And it didn't pay attention to the reality out there. It didn't pay attention to the geopolitical risks that we were going into during this transition because we would be making ourselves exceedingly dependent on Russia. Well, the naivety of our politicians and leaders and experts is one thing, but the fact that they didn't take any responsibility for it, that no one has stepped down or assumed responsibility for, for it, is quite dramatic. And just to point a finger on, on Moscow, doesn't really do it. It doesn't really do it because, you know, yeah, it, it, I don't want to go into that, but it is, um, it is actually very um, worrisome that uh, no political leader, no expert that, that got us into this place into this place um, where Europe is now, is taking responsibility for it. The same people that dismantle our military based on very naive and wrong strategic assumptions are the same people that are taking the decisions to today. And the same advisors that were giving advice 10, 15 years ago are, are giving advice today still. So, um, and interestingly, no one in media or financial industry seems to have a problem with that. So this is interesting. We have to pay attention to what is happening in the energy sector. And I say that because our Western governments want to double down with uh, interventions. There, there, are new, there is a new batch of interventions coming in 2023 that will further decimate the potential supply of energy in the years to come. And again, good intentions, fantastic intentions, you know climate change and uh, renewable energy. These are, these are understandable um, issues and renewable energy is, is a very um, uh, laudable, you know, good goal. But the implementation of these uh, ideas is still faulty, is still flawed, and it doesn't make strategic sense to me. The interesting thing is we're going to have a new batch of interventions and um, by uh, our Western governments in the energy sector that may harm supply going forward. Even the, the energy price caps, these energy price caps that the European Union has announced in recent weeks. I mean, I have to say it's, I, I can see the intention. I can see the intention. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that our EU leaders are going to become even more popular on social media for these decisions, but they are as flawed and terrible as the energy sanctions that, uh, that uh, the European Union announced in March, April, because these energy sanctions have only made Russia and the United States richer, but they have devastated the European Union's fiscal standing and have impoverished millions of European people. 
so our energy sanctions, I understand. It was an emotional reaction and we had to do something. But we have to be smart. We have to be smart because we are we are the only ones that we are really damaging is ourselves. So Europe is actually destroying itself with its energy interventions or energy sanctions. And now with these energy price caps, we are destroying ourselves, reducing our supply, reducing our energy security, increasing prices, uh, making Russia richer, really much richer than what it was. Russia is making more money now than a year ago. Um, and and um, and the United States is, of course, benefiting a lot from, from this, and we are not. So when we have a, an enemy or an adversary that we need to fight, we have to do it smartly, because on this track, on this path, the European Union will be bankrupt in a few years. And if we are bankrupt, we're not going to be able to help Ukraine or rebuild Ukraine either. So I just wish that our policies would be strategically uh, sensible, but also smart, smart. So when we when we fight, we have to fight in a way that we're harming the adversary more than we're harming ourselves. That's my point. So there's something with the energy complex that doesn't make sense. And, um, and I have the impression people need to pay attention to it. The next area is uh, the transatlantic relationship. NATO um, is part of that. And there is a, a major loss of trust in this transatlantic relationship. And it's incredible how our media and our experts are not talking about it. Either they are not aware of it or they don't want to talk about it because it is not helpful at the moment. It's not a narrative that they need to push. I understand we are at war. Uh, so that's understandable. But it doesn't mean that people shouldn't be aware of it. There is a major rift, a major loss of trust in the transatlantic relationship and um, uh, quite a number of important European countries uh, are feeling very, very uneasy about the United States in the last uh, two, three months. Um, some countries, some important leaders and officials in European governments are even saying that they feel betrayed by, by, by Washington. And, uh, and you know, this is not this. This was have been this would have been impossible five six months ago. But in the last two months, quite a number of important EU officials have said that, that they have now analyzed the whole situation and realized that now in hindsight, that the only one that has benefited from everything that happened in 2022 is is Washington. And this is a very tough assessment, right? Obviously, I understand that the press is not going to focus on this. Um, but you need to know about it, that um, uh, quite uh, important governments like Berlin and Paris uh, are very worried about what they are seeing and analyzed that, um, and what these intelligence officers and strategists and uh, government advisors and even government officials are saying is that in their view, um, the only major beneficiary of everything that has happened uh, to Europe in 2022 has been the United States and maybe to some extent, uh, you know, China, Turkey, Russia, you could say, but the, maybe Norway, uh, not partially, but the, the number one ben beneficiary is the United States. And maybe geopolitically, you could add Poland to it. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, but they're, they're, they're having big concerns about that. And um, that is actually something that has led to uh, many EU officials and the EU Commission to threaten the United States with a trade war in order to retaliate. What really, um, uh, this, the sabotage of the North, North Stream pipeline uh, was definitely a watershed moment. Um, Berlin was in, in shock after they did their own assessment there. Paris was also a little bit co concerned, uh, but what really tipped the balance uh, was the U.S. Inflation Protection Act. That Inflation Protection Act sounds very nice, but it's actually Trump policy of America first really implemented in a very harsh way. Because in, in, with that uh, Biden policy, um, the United States will favor U.S. companies at the expense of Chinese, but also European companies. And it is actually a very 
in the view of the EU, a very nationalistic protectionist policy that will hurt a lot of European companies and European jobs. Um, in a way, that was the last, the last you know, drop in a full packet because the war in Ukraine, the energy sanctions uh, against Russia, and all that happened afterwards, the, the massive increase of interest rates by, by the Fed and the, and the strong US dollar, they all devastated Europe. All of these things that have happened in 22 and that America has actually also carried out has devastated Europe every single time. Um, the, the way monetary policy has been conducted this year by the Fed has hurt Europe badly. And the U.S. Inflation Protection Act is just the last, the last piece that really broke the back of, you know, the patience by the EU. And you have to know that we're ending 2022 with a lot of uh, rift, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of tensions, very little trust. You could say a lot of distrust um, between the EU and the United States. And um, of course. The media is full of nice imagery. Imagery. Um, uh, our leaders are hailing the great transatlantic unity and our special relationships. Um, but you know, as it is in politics, the more the media is making an effort to to show how united we are in the EU and how united we are in NATO, the more you have to know that if they're making such an effort to present such unity, is because there is not that much unity. Um, and that is actually something that can be said of the EU as well. There are serious problems within the EU and actually there are more things that divide the EU countries than really unite them. This is the sad reality of the last four months. Um, some countries have been, in a way, uh, hurting their EU allies um, because it's about national interest, right? So one thing that Britain and Germany and France have learned in 2022 is that um, there are no real <laughs> friends in politics or geopolitics. They are only common interests. And, um, you know, the, the UK is helping in the war effort of Ukraine, but on the current track, on the current path, the UK is going to be completely devastated and bankrupt, you know. Many British thought leaders and politicians actually are acknowledging in the last in recent months that the UK is broken already, and 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 Germany is not far away from that. Germany is, of course, a much more organized and structured economy than the UK is. But um, yes, the UK has a very strong military. Germany doesn't have a good standing military, but it has a quite a healthy, well structured economy. But that economy is also running the risk of being devastated by very high energy prices. And Germany runs the risk of becoming uncompetitive for years to come. So um, Germany may follow the UK to some extent on the current path. So um, there is a huge disappointment, huge disappointment amongst um, a large number of European leaders as we end this year, disappointing about the United States. Many feel the United States has betrayed uh, the EU or has taken advantage of the EU. Others think that what is what happened was not really meant by it. And I think we don't know. We don't know for sure. It could be just that the work happened. It was not the intention in Washington and that Washington is simply taking advantage of what is happening this year, which is what many countries would do anyway. Right. But whether it was intentional or not, and we have to be careful not to um, presuppose things that we cannot prove, whether it was intentional or not, the, um, the, the fact is that the many European leaders feel that the United States took advantage of Europe in a very aggressive way in 2022. The U.S. is finishing this year in a very strong position. Also, the Biden administration is finishing this year in a very strong position. We have to say congrats, I mean, to what Biden has done. I think a lot of people underestimated President Biden. Uh, they said he's just very old. He can do nothing. But it's quite impressive what Washington has achieved in 2022. 
Well, the opposite can be said of the EU. The EU is finishing this year in a, in a worse position than it was at the beginning of the year. It's quite sad what is happening to, to Europe and quite a lot, a lot of people are leaving, leaving Europe. Um, they see what is coming and um, it's something to, to keep an eye on. Then there is also um, um, what I can call a related topic, which is the growing isolation of the West. This growing isolation of the West had, has been gathering pace uh, in, in, in over the last two decades. But two things have changed um, compared to two decades ago. Today, the so-called developing nations, emerging nations, the nations in the global south and the global east, are not as poor and weak as they were 10, 20 years ago. Now they are quite powerful and they are not that poor anymore. Even if that's what our media always was like, would like to, to show us, nations like India, Indonesia, uh, Brazil uh, are, have become powerful. The people are not living on trees there, and not everyone is there is vegetating and starving, as our media is always like to, is trying to show us, right? That. So um, these countries have become powerful with vibrant economies. And for once, the, the economies of these nations in the global south and the global east and in the east, many of these economies are much, much healthier than the Western economies. So they are healthier and they are able to withstand crisis even better than we can. And the reason is the Western economies are completely indebted and over-indebted. Actually, we are de facto bankrupt. Uh, we're just printing more money uh, and financial markets, instead of doing oversight, they're looking the other way. I mean, the situation in the West is really not very good, not very healthy. So um, nations in the East and the South have had enough of our excesses and our double standards, they say. And increasingly, they are getting organized to find uh, alternatives to our Western-led you know, global order and monetary system. That process has always been there, but there was always a difficulty. The Indians wouldn't talk to the Chinese, you know, and uh, the Pakistanis wouldn't talk to the Indians, things like that. And um, countries like Argentina and Brazil would just be two big rivals, you know. But something has happened. And what happened was the war in Ukraine. And it's not the war. It's what happened after the war, after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, when the West decided to weaponize uh, our currencies. We used our currencies as a weapon against Russia, and we decided also to seize Russian assets uh, of the Russian government, Russian companies, and Russian private people, private individuals. So we basically enacted, uh, started a war against Russia, started seizing Russian assets around the world without any court ruling. We just decided to, to do so. Uh, there was no court in Den Haag, international independent court that says you're allowed to seize the assets of Mr. So-and-so and this company. So what we did was an emotional act. And I think it was, you could say, a righteous act. But what we didn't pay attention to is how the rest of the world would view that. The rest of the world said the people, I mean, leaders and I mean, the owners of massive companies in India, Indonesia, Brazil, and China said, if they can do that to Russia, they can do that to us, right? They can always find a reason. And this actually accelerated the process of our isolation, the isolation of the West in the world, because the Indians and the Chinese were not willing to work together until April this year. But since April, they are even able to have a little war and some skirmishes on the border and still continue to work together to find an alternative, an alternative currency to the US dollar and to build an alternative banking system to our Western banking system. So what we did in April, uh, we thought was to hurt Russia. It has not hurt Russia that much. Uh, it has boomeranged on us because the using our currencies as a weapon, using our currencies as a weapon invited Russia to use gas as a weapon too. And seizing Russian assets scared all the rich people and governments in Indonesia, Pakistan, India, Brazil, 
Chile, Colombia, Vietnam, uh, you know, Philippines, Malaysia, name all these countries. We're talking about the countries that are really, really upset uh, and, and scared by that are a vast majority of nations in the world. And um, our only way to deal with that is threats. We have threatened these countries not to take action against us. We've threatened them uh, to force them to vote with us at the UN. We've used a lot of threats this year to contain the anger of these nations. But these countries in the South and the East, the Middle East and Africa, are really angry at the West. They are willing to put their differences aside to, um, to come up with, a, with an alternative uh, currency so they can trade with one another and so that they can put their reserves and savings uh, in a new currency something that is not US dollars, pounds or euros or Swiss francs maybe. So they are actually now no longer trusting that we will respect the rule of law and that we will not touch their savings if we are angry at them. That's, that's, that's the point. They think that we don't respect the rule of law um, and, and that we will touch their savings in the same way that we seized you know, Russian savings earlier this year. So again here, um, I think we did some strategic mistakes and we underestimated the reaction of the rest of the world to our uh, you know, uh, sanctions and response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine early this year. I think that the West has made, the West, especially Europe and the United States have made quite a few serious mistakes and errors in this year, especially Europe. And that isolation of the West, uh, you know, that was accelerated, uh, was advanced in March, April, has been accelerated um, just the last two months at the World Cup, the Football World Cup organized by FIFA in Qatar. There, most of Europe and the West at, really attacked Qatar for not changing its rules and laws. Um, in order to improve the situation of, um, you know, of minorities, LG LGBTQ minorities in the country. And although, again, our uh, goals were, were actually a good goal, the way we went about it uh, was maybe not very smart because we are more dependent on Qatar than ever before here in Europe. More than ever before we're depending. Qatar is the largest LNG exporter de facto, the largest LNG exporter in the world, um, with the, one of the largest reserves, and I would say the largest exporter with a kind of flexible, free, you know, um, supply uh, uh, pipeline. Uh, so Qatar is a very important ally for Europe at the moment. But we went to Qatar. It's like going to someone's house and tell tell the owner of the house how he should raise his kids and how he should do his food and how he should uh, treat other people. If we had, if the World Cup had taken place in France or Germany, it would have been a very different thing. It would have been a bit borderline, but I think we could have been able to get away with that because Oriental people respect that. You have to respect the rules of the house. This is a very Oriental thing. You have to respect the rule of the house, but, the, but also in the Orient, you have to, uh, save you have to allow people to save face and we broke these two things we were in qatar and in this foreign country we told we actually put pressure on, on the government of qatar to change certain things um, to improve the living conditions of minorities that we care about and the you know the ideal was was good but the the, the implementation was not smart. Actually, I believe that we have harmed our interests in the Middle East, Africa, a lot. And not only that, the whole global south and the east of the world, plus Africa, were, were furious at the West, what we did. So twice this year, the West has managed to infuriate and anger most of the world. And... I don't know why we do these kind of things and why we can do our things a bit smart, more smartly. If we want to contain Russia and hurt Russia, there are smarter ways of doing that. If we want to uh, influence the situation of Qatar 
there are smarter ways of doing that. And the worst thing that we can do is to humiliate, I mean, Qatar felt humiliated around the world by our criticism and our actions. And it was when they were conducting probably the biggest event ever in their history at home. So I don't think they will ever forgive that. <laughs> I don't think they will ever forget that. Um, this is this is actually remarkable because this is now connecting the fact that we need energy and we had asked Qatar to give us more gas. Why should they give us more gas? Now they're even thinking about walking back uh, the contract they gave to us, you know, and they had not given us already much of the LNG because after the war, after our sanctions against Russia, Qatar decided to prioritize China and China's allies over Europe. Still, we were able to ask to, to win a little bit and convince Qatar to give us some of their gas. But after this, I think that we should be surprised if Qatar would stop the deliveries at any point in time uh, or change the amount. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. The next point is uh, Latin America. Latin America is very important. Um, uh, very important for uh, raw materials. Um, just to give an example, Brazil, Chile, Peru, you know, Brazil, very important for um, for food and raw materials export, but also Peru and Chile for copper, just to mention something, you know. And um, we need Latin America to implement our green transition and to achieve our uh, goals for renewable energies. And um, But there is a great battle for Latin America raging out there. And um, China has the advantage. So we have to watch that. Now, over the last two years after COVID, uh, important economies in South America, sorry, Latin America, shifted left, hard left, we could even say. A lot of socialism, communism uh, uh, came back to the continent. But what I want to report to you today is that this is coming to a halt. This is coming to a halt in recent months. Uh, it's not advancing further left. If anything, there is correction. Um, people, voters are making corrections. Um, uh, Chilean, Chilean voters decided to reject their new constitution, which was too leftist, too socialist. And some even say too much the agenda, the agenda of the World Economic Forum. So uh, there is actually um, some correction there. And we might see over the next uh, one or two years a certain correction there with voters in Latin America, I'm speaking about important nations, correcting backwards, back to the middle, maybe to the right, okay? So there is, um, not everything has been said and done in Latin America. Latin America, the next big shift could be to the right. And this is important for um, uh, iron ore prices, copper prices, gold prices for, for quite a number of um, uh, products like soya so it's um, it, it is um, it is it is actually quite interesting what is happening in Latin America last but not least what do these five things that I just uh, these five areas that I have addressed what does it what does this mean for people that are investing or for people that are running businesses out there what this means I believe is that you should be cautious as you enter 2023 um, I know that a lot of people like to take high confidence bets. That's how they make their money. They say high confidence bets. I think that the beginning of 2023 is not the ideal time to make such high confidence bets. To make bets, you need data, analyze data and make forecasts. But the quality of the data is doubtful. Um, also, what our governments have done in the last one or two years uh, the level of interest rates, the level of inflation. I don't know if the data really, really reflects the reality of the economy out there. I have my doubts about it, about the continuity, the quality, and the truthfulness of the data. And I understand the situation of governments. Um, if inflation is 18%, you cannot report 18%. Even if it's 13%, you can't report 13%. You're going to try to report 9.9%, because there is a psychological, uh, you know, 
difference between 10% and 9%. It's a huge, um, it's a double digit inflation. You're entering the spectrum of hyperinflation when you enter a double digit, okay? Um, inflation momentum. So uh, it's understandable because the government doesn't want uh, uh, people to demand uh, 11% of double digit, double digit uh, salary increases, right? Uh, all of a sudden things get out of control. But our Western governments, they need inflation. They need inflation, right? They just don't want it to get to be a runaway uh, hyperinflationary inflation so that the system gets out, gets out of hand or out of control. But in this current environment, I would be cautious with forecasts, economic forecasts for 2023. Um, I, th I think that we cannot have much confidence in the data uh, that we have had recently. And therefore, we should be cautious in attaching too much confidence in the forecasts that we're making. And with uh, low confidence in data and forecasts, I think we should be cautious with making very, very, very tacit, very strong forecasts and bets as we go into 2023. I suggest people to wait a little bit and see how things develop. The economy could go into a recession. There could be a, a massive housing crash. But on the other hand, yes, and not only that, we also have a very tight, I mean, a, a very big squeeze in liquidity supply. All of the things... Uh, suggest we're going to have uh, a, a recession or a very difficult economy. On the other hand, there is a, a lack for qualified labor. Uh, the labor markets are not weak. Uh, on the other hand, there is a huge shortage for, for housing. And uh, last but not least, our Western governments, especially Western governments, G7 governments, are behaving uh, very aggressively in terms of intervening in the economy. Our governments have become very interventionistic. They are intervening massively and without any checks and balances. No one is limiting that. Normally, financial markets have to do uh, an oversight of government finances, but they are not doing it. Financial markets are not doing it since the year 2009. With some rare ex exceptions like like this fall in, in the UK, but normally they are not doing it. And so our governments are now uh, making, uh, are now intervening in a strong way in the supply, aggregate supply and aggregate demand. Our governments are actually issuing insurances and guarantees to big companies and industries. And where do these insurances go? Are they going into the national debt? No, actually, uh, our governments are creating a new way of stimulating the economy that goes beyond traditional fiscal policy and beyond monetary policy. So while the normal monetary policy looks like it's tight and restrictive, our governments are finding new ways and aggressive ways to stimulate the economy. And all of that is difficult to forecast. And it's actually crowding out private investments but you know it may it may really work it may really work as the year evolves so um i think it is uh, harder than ever <laughs> in recent history to make uh, accurate forecasts of economic growth in in this coming year and earnings you know earnings could actually look uh, could have a very bad start but then in the in the course of the year see an improvement it all is really quite uncertain. So my suggestion is to be cautious with forecasts, with too exact a forecast or too exact an expectation for the new year, and to be cautious with uh, too many high confidence bets in, in, in what you're doing, either in your business or your investments. So that's it from my side. I'd like to finish by wishing you all a, um, a, you know, a, a, a nice Christmas season. Uh, a nice finish of the year 2022 and yeah and a blessed 2023 for you your health and your family that's it from christian takushi and my own family and our team and um uh thank you again for uh, uh you know uh, following us and, and and your loyalty all these years thank you